Well, hello, friends of ADHD Science. This is Russ Barkley, back again with a short commentary on an article from a research journal that made the news today. This article deals with the topic of neurofeedback treatment for ADHD. Now, before I get into the results of this research review, I just want to point out, first of all, I covered this topic earlier in the year under biofeedback, but that was before this recent review came out. Second, I'd like to report that neurofeedback has been around for a very long time. As you can see here in Wikipedia, the history of neurofeedback actually goes back to about 1962, when the first formal attempt at conditioning brain electrical activity, known as EEG biofeedback, was attempted by Joe Camilla. Uh, that was done with subjects having their eyes closed and then responding to a tone. We don't need to worry about that. Just want to acknowledge that history. Uh, in addition, it was really Barry Sturman who adopted the EEG biofeedback protocol, which he used to train cats in reducing their frequency of epileptic seizures. It was Joel Lubar who later extended the use of biofeedback to treating children and later adults with ADHD. Now, let me just briefly explain what neurofeedback is or EEG biofeedback if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and by the way, I'm over at the Wikipedia website uh, and that's what I'm reading from. As it says here, neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback that uses the electrical potentials in the brain to reinforce desired brain states and related behavior, by the way, through operant conditioning. It's a non-invasive technique. Now, let me bring up this diagram and show you what neurofeedback involves. First of all, electrodes are attached to the scalp and are used to measure brain electrical activity. Nothing exciting about that. We've known about the brain's electrical activity for a very long time. More recently, neurofeedback doesn't glue the electrodes to the head, but instead usually uses some kind of a helmet or a band in which the electrodes are embedded and the band or helmet is put on the head and the brain's electrical activity is monitored that way. Now, before I go further, I do want to point out that for years, going back to the 1970s, if not earlier, we have known that ADHD is associated with altered states of EEG brain waves. People with ADHD have a lot less beta activity, which is the activity associated with attention and concentration, and a lot more theta activity, which is more associated with a uh, under-aroused, more sleepy, if you will, brain state, but a less active brain state that is not associated with concentration. Uh, and people have often argued that you might be able to use brain waves for the diagnosis of ADHD. That hasn't proven to be especially accurate for clinical practice. But the point here is that Yes, there are differences in brainwave activity in people with ADHD. Now, the purpose of biofeedback is to change those EEG brainwave patterns. So back to the diagram, that's done by recording the brain's electrical activity and showing it on a computer screen, usually to the investigator and not to the subject or the patient. And then this EEG pattern is transferred into some kind of visual presentation, like a game. And by playing the game, the individual can alter their brainwave activity. So it's a form of operant conditioning, and they're usually rewarded for these improvements in certain brainwaves, such as increasing beta waves and decreasing theta waves. And that reinforcement is supposed to reward the brain for these practice or the practicing these brain states that leads to improvement in the EEG. And it's believed that this leads to improvement in attention, concentration, inhibition, and other symptoms related to ADHD. So that's how neurofeedback works. It's a form of reinforcement conditioning. Now, earlier studies, and there are many of them, 
have reported that there are positive improvements associated with neurofeedback, not only in playing these games, but in neuropsychological tests believed to assess ADHD symptoms, and in some studies, even changes in ratings of ADHD symptoms collected out in the natural environment from the patient, for instance, if it's adults, from parents and teachers, if it's not, if we're dealing with children. But in any case, there are these studies that show such changes. The problem is, is that most of that research is not rigorously done. It doesn't necessarily involve randomized assignment to treatment, or if it does, it doesn't involve blinded assessments where the person evaluating the patient does not know what treatment they have received. And most importantly, many of those studies did not use placebo controls, especially sham biofeedback, in order to show that it really was the active biofeedback that was improving the patient's EEG, their performance on psychological tests, and later their improvements in behavior in the real world. So there was a lot wrong with many of these earlier studies. Subsequently, there have been a number of studies, at least six by my count, probably more, that did use more rigorous methods to test whether biofeedback actually is what is causing the improvements in psychological testing and in behavior in the natural setting. What those studies found is that biofeedback was no better than these sham placebos in either improving neuropsychological tests or resulting in improvements in behavior in the environment. Indeed, a number of these better controlled studies found no improvements of behavior in the natural setting. So that's the status of things leading up to today's article. So what's so impressive about what happened today? Well, today there was published in the journal JAMA Psychiatry, a review of all of the research on neurofeedback for ADHD. And they conducted a meta-analysis, which means they got the data from all of these studies, put them all together and analyze them in their totality for whether or not neurofeedback was effective at helping ADHD. Now, what makes this an important review, I think, is first of all, it's a multi-center authored paper. So we have members of the, uh, that is the authors, come from England, from France, from Germany, from Hungary, from Italy, uh, from uh, also the U.S. So a number of investigators and sites were used to conduct this review and especially this analysis of all the data. The authors report further down that they were able to identify 38 randomized clinical trials involving more than 2,400 participants with ADHD. The analyses they looked at tested whether or not the outcomes were related to blinded assessments, that is good rigorous blinding of the patient, or excuse me, of the people reporting on the results of biofeedback. They also looked at neuropsychological tests and outcomes. And what they concluded is that there was no evidence of meaningful benefits from neurofeedback as a treatment for ADHD. So while I have made this conclusion earlier, it was not based on as many studies as is this review. So this is a pretty robust outcome. I think we can take this to the bank and draw the conclusion that EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback is not effective for the management of ADHD. Now, in fairness, the authors do go on to point out that there was a small statistically significant positive effect when they looked at the results of a neuropsychological test that measured processing speed, how quickly you're able to process information. There was a small positive effect found there. But as you know from my other videos, neuropsychological testing does not correlate with or predict ADHD symptoms nor does it correlate with or predict behavior 
such as ADHD symptoms in the real world environment, nor does it predict impairments in major life activities. So these tests suffer from very little ecological validity. So I don't put much stock into that little positive finding on processing speed. After all, ADHD is not a disorder of processing speed at the heart of the disorder, even if some people with ADHD may suffer from that as a problem. So in conclusion, this very nice review published today on neurofeedback concludes that there is no benefit from this treatment for ADHD. I thought you might want to know. Thanks for joining me today for this brief commentary on research on ADHD and specifically on neurofeedback. Hope you'll join me again this Saturday for my weekly research roundup and later for my other commentaries. I'll be talking about bipolar disorder and ADHD next week, so stay tuned for that video. Again, thanks for joining me, and I always appreciate it when people sign up as subscribers to this channel. I appreciate the replies that I get uh, from uh, people who view the video, uh, and I want to thank everyone for watching my channel. So take care, live well, and be well. Bye for now.